Great to see you here. Mark, team, thank you so much. Wonderful. Church, we must never lose our voice. It's been a little bit quiet. I don't know if it's that kind of shake off the dust, you know, end of Christmas. Listen, we must never lose our voice. There's power in our worship, power in our singing. It doesn't change God, it changes us. And uh, something happens. And I, I think, you know, during COVID, where there was that ridiculous time where we weren't allowed to sing according to the laws of the land, not even with a face mask on. And, it, and then I think we came back. I remember that time, a lot of us, we'd, we'd become like an audience rather than a congregation. We've got to keep fighting to keep our voice. It's powerful. It changes us. Can someone say amen? amen. Well, great to see you and happy new year. Uh, I don't know whether... Uh, whether you've been back to work this week or feel like that was a long time ago. Uh, we've been uh, so grateful for a few days away as a family in Derbyshire. Had a beautiful time feeling rested and refreshed. And uh, well, as you would expect, um, if you've been around here a little while, you'll know I'm excited for what's about to come because I love these seasons of prayer and fasting that we step into tomorrow. If you're new, allow me to extend a warm welcome to you today. Great to have you here. And uh, if you're just landing, yes, we are about to step into 21 days of prayer and fasting. The, the fasting is optional. We encourage everyone to get involved in some way, to engage, to do what you can. And uh, some people ask us, you know, what, why are we praying and fasting? Like, do we, are we going after something in particular? Yeah, we're going after God. Is it like, it's simple. It's not, when we're not trying to twist his arm because we need a breakthrough. Well, we might need breakthroughs in certain areas we might pray, but primarily we're seeking the face of God because he is worth seeking. And Jesus said, if you seek, you will, fine. you'll find. And so like a seeker, you know, sometimes the, 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 the phrase was coined, wasn't it? Like a seeker sensitive churches, you know, that's talking about seekers, those who are not yet believers. But I have been a believer for 35 years. I'm still a seeker because Jesus said, if I seek, I'll find. We've got to still be seekers, those that go after God. And so that is why we're praying and fasting. And you've heard some details already about how to engage, ways that you can get involved, the booklets, the triplets, all of that. And as you know, uh, we are going to be in John's gospel over these three weeks. I'm super excited about it. To be clear, if you have a regular Bible reading plan, we are not looking to disrupt that. It's so important. I know many of you have a discipline. Please stay on track with that. But can we invite you to add in one chapter of John? That is not a lot to do. But if you don't have a regular reading plan, then John's gospel is where you're going to be over the next 21 days. I hope and I trust and I know it's going to be a wonderful time for us. What I'd like to do today is begin with one of the focus verses for the coming week that we're going to land on on Wednesday. Uh, but also, I want to give us some overarching thoughts and context for the Gospel of John. And then we're going to return to that verse and apply it for us today. So a bit of an overview and a bit of a focus all in one. The title for today is Make Room. Can we all say together? Make Room. Make Room. We are looking to make room for God. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time ahead of us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity as brothers and sisters to come together, to spur one another on. And we pray above all, would you draw us deeper into yourself? Would you help us to find you, help us to come after you? Would you awaken a passion, a zeal, a love for you, Lord, that we would find ourselves increasing in our hunger for you. Even as we are fulfilled and satisfied, we would become hungry for more. We'd be a, be a people that are in pursuit of you. We pray, God, meet us as we seek you for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't you head with me to John chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to read some verses out of John 1 and John 3 just to set us up today. Uh, John the Baptist was the forerunner to Jesus. It was prophesied that he would go ahead of the Lord, that he would make ready a people prepared for God. John was Jesus' cousin, but incredibly he had this prophetic mantle on his life that he was preparing the way for the one that would follow. This was the call, this was his mandate, to prophesy about and to identify Jesus as the Christ. And this is what it says in John 1, 19 to 34. We'll catch this tomorrow if we're staying on track 
with our, with our journey through John's gospel. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, who are you then? Are, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who've been questioning him said, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. We jump to verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is God's chosen one. And then we catch up with John a couple of chapters later, John 3, 22 to 30, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. To this, John replied, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. You yourself can testify. I said, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends to the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and now it's complete. He must become greater. I must become less. What a great verse. And that's where we're going to come back to in just a few moments. John's gospel is an absolute treasure. I, it's rich. It's deep. It's intimate. It takes you very close to the person of Jesus, which is exactly what John is trying to do. That the writer of the gospel, John the writer, is not John the Baptist that we've just heard about. It's a different John. John the Baptist, as I've already said, was Jesus' cousin. He was the prophet preparing the way. But John was one of the disciples called by Jesus. He was the brother of James. They were the, the sons of Zebedee. They were the ones that were in the boats with, with Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and, and Jesus called to John and to James and said, come follow me. And they, they left everything and followed him. And John writes his gospel here, his account, his eyewitness account. He was there for the miracles. He was there for the teachings. He saw Jesus dying on the cross. He's recorded as one in the crowd, observing what is going on. He was the first one to make it to the empty tomb out of the disciples. He was present for it all. And he records his gospel some years later, along with, with uh, Simon Peter and his brother James, there were the three that seemed to be an, an inner circle, even within the 12, there were moments where it was only James, John, and Peter, such as on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then John uh, says in his gospel, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. He had seen him glorified. He was there at the, the raising of Jairus' daughter when everyone else was sent out except the, the parents of the girl and Peter, James and John. He was there, he bore witness. He says about the cross, he who saw it has borne witness, speaking of himself. They were there in the intimate space in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
John, John was unquestionably close to Jesus. In the gospel, he calls himself the one whom Jesus loved. Maybe that's how Jesus made everybody feel. But there seems to be a definite closeness, a proximity. Of course, John is the one also who received the revelation on Patmos, which is the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. It was a vision, a visitation. John was there. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he appeared to me. And he said, behold, I was dead, but behold, I am alive forever and ever. I'm the first, I'm the last. And he has this incredible revelation. There's some debate, as nearly always among scholars, as to, as to the timings exactly of things. But most scholars would believe that the visitation at Patmos, which gives us the book of Revelation, took place before John completed his gospel. And I love this idea, uh, whether, whether it's accurate or not, we can't be certain. But I love this idea that John has been caught up into heaven. And he's seen the tens of thousands times 10,000 angels singing, Worthy is the Lamb. And now he writes in the gospel, The Lamb of God who takes away. Because he knows he's seen the Lamb in heaven. He knows who this is. That he's seen in heaven, in Revelation, there is a wedding to come. The wedding of the bride of Christ, us, the church, and the bridegroom, Jesus. And, and in his gospel account, he speaks of Jesus as a bridegroom. He's trying to help us to see what he's already seen. Whether the timings are, are as suggested or not, John got it. John totally got it. 300 years later, the Council of Nicaea would confirm in mainstream Christian doctrine that Jesus is fully God, that he is fully divine, the same substance, homo usios, with the Father. But John, he was there. He said, he said, the Word became flesh and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. He says, no one has ever seen God but, uh, but the one and only Son who himself is God. This is in John chapter 1 is in close relationship with the Father and has made God known. It was also no doubt that Jesus was fully human. He says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We see aspects of Jesus' humanity in John, his weariness uh, at the, the well of Samaria, his emotion as he weeps at Lazarus' tomb, his thirsting on the cross. We'll, we'll touch all of these verses over the next 21 days. And John is crystal clear about the purpose for his gospel. He's writing that any who would read would believe in Jesus and receive life. This is what he says towards the end of his book, John 20, 30 to 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. For those of us who already believe, who don't need to be convinced, we'll be, we will be enriched by diving into this gospel. I think I was 23 when I, I went away for a week with a friend of mine. I was 22, 23, a friend of mine called Rich. And uh, we went to stay in, a, in a, a little terraced house in Hull that was owned by a couple we knew who'd, who'd moved city. They were trying to sell it, and it was empty. And we had no money to hire anywhere, but they let us go and stay in their empty house. And it was a two up, two down, had a couple of bedrooms, had a couple of beds. There was no TV there, but there was a sofa and a chair. And we went there to pray and fast. And it was the first week, I think, that I went to pray and fast as a young guy, purely to go after God, purely to seek God. And my mate and I, we, we just went, it was, it was freezing. The house had been empty for about six months. It took all week. It, did, it never warmed up all week, even with the heat on. But, uh, but we, I took my guitar, my friend took his flute, and the neighbors heard us through the walls worshiping, and they reported us to the owners who they know and said, some hippies are squatting in your house. And they said, no, they're, they're friends of ours. They're a bit mad, but they're praying and fasting, and that's the sound of worship. Uh, not hippies. Um, so anyway, there you go. But I remember that week I was in John's Gospel. And I read it and I reread it. I camped in it. I dug into it. I got deep. I meditated on it. And I, I went into the depths of John and I fell in love with John's Gospel. What an incredible book. It is rich. It is deep. 
And I encourage you, I invite you, no matter how many times you've read it, to dive into it. Let the riches of it touch your soul. There's a famous story about Bono, the lead singer of of, uh, the band U2, and the author of the message version of the Bible, Eugene Peterson. And I don't know, you might know this. They actually became friends, and you can see them on YouTube discussing the Psalms. But Bono came across the message version, the New Testament and Psalms, and was deeply touched by it. And he reached out to Eugene Peterson to see if he could go and meet him personally. And Eugene Peterson had never heard of Bono. And he was working on the Old Testament, and he was trying to get finished, and he was under deadline pressure to write. And so he said, no, you can't come and see me. And he turned Bono down. Now, now, later on, they, they made a connection, as I've said. And famously, Eugene Peterson was interviewed. And the interview said, you know, so you turned down one of the most famous people on the planet, uh, Bono. And, um, and, and, and he said, like, but, but I, I, didn't, I didn't know who he was. And I was working hard. And the guy says, but it was Bono. And Eugene Peterson says, but it was Isaiah. And I love that. It's like, I don't care about Bono. I was working on Isaiah. I feel like that about John. But it was John. I might be a bit vacant these next 21 days because it's John. It's John's gospel. So I invite you to dive in. Also, for those who are not familiar with John's gospel, I want to point out to you so that you can look out for them when they come, the seven I am statements of Jesus in John's gospel and the seven signs of John meticulously chosen miracles. John is writing for Jewish readers. They understand that seven is the perfect number, and John intentionally seven times captures Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. I am the the bread of life. Of course, when Moses encountered God at the burning bush in Exodus chapter three, Moses asked God what his name is, and God replies to him, Aa Asher Aa, which which is simply translated, I am that I am. What is your name, O God, that speaks to me from this bush? I am that I am. It's this revelation that God is, He always is. But there's a time you'll see in John's Gospel, chapter eight, where Jesus is discussing matters with some Jews, and and Jesus claims to to know Abraham. And they say, you're not 50 years old, and yet you've seen Abraham. And Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And at that point, they look to stone him. They understand that him using this phrase, I am, he is saying, I am God. The, I, I am that I am. This is a, it's, it's light in the blue touch paper among the Jews to use this statement. And yet seven times in John's gospel, Jesus intentionally says, I am something. And look out for it. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. John 6, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. We can feed on him in our spirits. He says, I am the light of the world, John 8. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Let the light of Christ illuminate your darkness these three weeks as we come to seek him. He's the light of the world. I am, Jesus says, the door for the sheep, John 10. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. In Jesus' time, it was common for a sheepfold to adjoin the shepherd's house. And we come home through Jesus. He brings us salvation. We find our safety, our security, our nourishment in him and from him. He says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. My sheep know my voice. These 21 days, let's deepen our relationship with him. Listen for his voice. Discern his voice as he speaks gently into our spirits. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. He is our hope. He is the one who gives us eternal hope that in him we shall live even though we die. What a promise. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wow. He is God. He also makes a way to God that we can know him and know the Father. He says, 
I am the true vine, John 15. Remain in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. Friends, Jesus is the key to our purpose. If we remain in him, we will be fruitful. We will find our destiny. We will outwork our purpose, the reason for which we have been born. But also look out for the seven signs. John acknowledges that Jesus did many miracles. In chapter six, he speaks of many healings and miracles that Jesus had done. He closes his gospel by saying this in John 21. Jesus did many other things as well. Even if, sorry, if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And yet, in his gospel account, he records only seven Again, the perfect number, seven miracles recorded in John. But he doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. They're there that we might see something. They're chosen. So when you hear a miracle, know that it's a sign and ask the Holy Spirit to show you what, what are you telling me about yourself? What is being revealed here? I think Jesus is performing many of these signs to, to show us who he really is. You might remember that, that, that time recorded in Luke's gospel where the paralytic is lowered down through the roof. And, and Jesus says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or, or take up your mat and walk. But so that you might know that I can say the former, I say to you, take up your mat and walk, and he's healed. And I think it's a little bit like this. We are seeing things about Jesus, but he is demonstrating that they are true by performing a sign. Which is easier, to say I am the resurrection and the life or to raise Lazarus? Well, so that you know that what I just said is true, Lazarus, come forth. What are the seven signs? Well, firstly, John chapter two uh, turns water into wine. What is, what is he showing us here? Well, have a look for yourself. Try and work it out. Pray. Read around it. I think he's showing us that he's a bridegroom because he says, my time has not yet come. And then he performs the miracle. If it wasn't his time to perform the miracle, why would he have performed the miracle? But I don't think he's saying that. It was the bridegroom's job to provide the wine. And he says, my time has not yet come. Why? Because there's a, there's a wedding coming. Jesus in his earthly life did not marry, but he still said, my time is coming. Well, I will be a bridegroom, the wedding that is in heaven, the bride of Christ, but so that we might believe that he is a bridegroom, he creates 700 bottles of vintage wine in a moment, which is easier to say, I am the bridegroom in heaven, or to do what Jesus did. These are signs, and John is putting them there that we might understand who Jesus is. Secondly, he heals the official son. He does so by speaking the word at a distance. Surely only God can create by speaking. Is he showing us that through him all things were created by the word of his mouth? Thirdly, in John 5, he heals the man born at the pool of Bethesda, and he does so on the Sabbath. Is he showing us that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, which would mean he is the one who created the Sabbath? Only, only the one who created the Sabbath can be Lord of the Sabbath. Fourthly, in John 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Is he showing us that he's the one who fed Israel in the desert? Which is easier to say, I provided manna from heaven or to provide lunch for a multitude out of a, a, a small boy's packed lunch. Fifthly, in John 6, Jesus walks on the water. Is he showing us that he's the Lord of all creation, the one who created the seas? Only the creator has authority over that which he's created. Sixthly, in John 9, he heals the man born blind. Is he taking us back to Psalm 146 where it says, the Lord God sets prisoners free. The Lord God gives sight to the blind. Which is easy to say, I am the one in, in, one, uh, in Psalm 146 or to actually heal a man born blind. I think Jesus is saying, let, so that you may believe the former, let me show you the latter. And as I've already referenced, the seventh sign is John 11, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Look out for the signs. So friends, how do we approach this coming week? Well, in the verses we read, John the Baptist is being asked if he's the Messiah. Clearly, he carries an anointing. People are going out to the wilderness in their droves and, and being baptized and repenting. But John says, no, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not the Messiah. 
I'm, I'm just the forerunner. I'm the support act. I'm the promoter, not the champion. I baptize with water, but one is coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He'll baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then more people are going over to Jesus. And John's disciples are, are concerned. The ministry that they've been part of is no longer the talk of Israel because somebody else is drawing the attention. And it's very natural to want to protect maybe what, what has been established. But John's response is beautiful because he's, he's so happy about it. He's not trying to defend his ministry. He said, this is fantastic. This is exactly what needed to happen. I must become less and he must become greater. That word must is better translated behoves. It's an old word, well, old word that means I have a duty, a responsibility. He's saying I have a responsibility to become less that he may become greater. I have a duty to become less that he may increase. And for, for all of us, if we are believers, if we are seeking to follow Christ, it behoves us. This is not just the words of John the Baptist. This is a blueprint for our Christian walk. I'd say for 35 years of seeking to follow Jesus, this has been what I have been trying to do, become less that he may become greater. To die to self, to, to die to the flesh. Less of me and more of him to make room for him in my life. And this is my invitation to us this week. That we make room, that we make this a verse for this week, that he might become greater and that we might become less. That he might increase, that we might diminish. But we have to make room. How do we do it? Four things that we need really briefly. Number one, we need humility that embraces his superiority. Like John the Baptist, we have to come to the realization that Jesus is God that we are unworthy, that, to put it simply, he really is greater, and we really are less. And if we believe that, then we will want to make room for his majesty. We've just been singing majesty. If we believe in his majesty, we will want to reduce that he may increase in us. At the age of 17, I, I wrestled before giving my life to Christ for six months. I'd come to believe in God. I'd come to believe that Jesus was the Son of God who died for me. But I also grasped that to truly embrace his forgiveness for my sins, I needed to embrace his lordship. And I wasn't ready to lay down my dreams and my plans until I saw it properly. And someone came and preached on the cross and it was like a lens that had been out of focus that I didn't realize was out of focus till it came into focus. And I saw the majesty of Jesus on the cross. And I saw his greatness compared to my grottiness. Me, little grotty me, trying to hold on to my plans. And I saw the beauty and the majesty of Jesus, who is God the Son, hanging, bleeding, naked on the cross for me. And I pushed out of my little pew in an Anglican church. And I came down the front to say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. And I got out of the driving seat of my life that day and I sat myself in the passenger seat. And I say, Lord, you are the driver of my life. Whatever, wherever, whenever. But we need humility to embrace his superiority. His majesty, this week, that we might afresh humble ourselves before him, acknowledge his greatness. We can ask him to bless our pl plans, but a, a better prayer is that we put our plans on the altar and we surrender our will once again and say, Lord, whatever you want, because you are God. We make room by doing that. Secondly, we need dependency that activates or appropriates his sufficiency. He becomes greater in us when we recognize how much we need him. When we stop trying to do everything for ourselves, but we come, not afraid of, of hard work or application, but needful of his grace, needful of his work in us. Needful for him to be our all in all. Even this morning, I got up, there was a wrestle in my heart, and I had to say, oh, Jesus, I need you. Your greater love, your greater grace. I, I, I need you. I can't do this by myself. I can't do this in myself. But would you come and help me? Would you come and fill me? Would you let your life, your beauty, supersede my sin? 
And when we do that, we open the doors to everything that he is, the I am statements of Jesus. We appropriate them ourselves. He becomes the bread of life to us and we feed on him. He becomes the light of the world to us and his light comes into our darkness. He becomes the door to us through which we enter in and encounter him. He becomes the good shepherd to us whose voice we learn to hear. He becomes the resurrection and the life to us today, renewing us and bringing us new life. He becomes the way to the Father for us. He becomes the true vine to us through whom and in whom we find our fruitfulness and our purpose. Thirdly, we need yieldedness that bows to his divinity. That we would yield before him and and acknowledge that he is God and allow godliness to be in our lives. A yielding that makes room for him. This week for me, part of making room will be inviting Jesus by the Holy Spirit to examine my heart and my life afresh. Is anything out of whack? Is anything ungodly? Is there a lack of the divine in my life that I've not made room for that he might come? I have to yield. The most spiritual word I know is yield. Over many years now of seeking to follow Jesus, I just know if I can yield, if I will humble myself, if I will bow, if I will allow his will to supersede my will, if I will echo the prayers of Jesus in Gethsemane, if I will yield, not my will, but yours be done. Then he becomes greater in me. His divinity comes into me. When we allow the Holy Spirit to examine us, we often find there are things there that we didn't realize were there. C.S. Lewis, the Christian writer, author of the Chronicles of Narnia, wrote in his book, Surprised by Joy, for the first time I examined myself with a seriously practical purpose, and there I found what appalled me, a zoo of lusts, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, a harem of fondled hatreds. My name was Legion. It's allowing the Holy Spirit in. Does anything need to be corrected in me? Tamsin, would you come? Am I being disobedient to what he said? Can I do better? Or step up from where I am? Would Christ be found in me? My friends, let's make room. Let's make room. He is greater. If we make room, he will increase as we decrease. And lastly, we need hunger that yearns for his proximity. Our decreasing makes room for him. And as this takes place, our encounter increases. For John the Baptist, it was, it was like a baton change of ministry. His, his prophetic work had been done and now Jesus stepped into his ministry. But for us, it is an incredibly dynamic process. As we decrease and he increases, we experience encounter with the living God. This is why I get so excited about these times of prayer because I know I'm going to encounter the Lord. Will I come this week as a worshipper? Will you? Will I allow there to be a hunger that yearns for His proximity, that desires His presence, that seeks after Him, that pursues Him, that says, God, I'm coming after you. I long for you. That echoes David saying in the Psalms, one thing only do I seek to dwell in the house of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. The sons of Korah say, when can I go and meet with God? My soul thirsts for you, the living God. We know the promise is found in James that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. That week I spent in Hull that I mentioned earlier, my first week, I think, pursuing God purely for himself, praying and fasting. The place we were standing was Nothing to write home about. But I made room. And as has has happened every time I've made room, he came and I encountered him. I sensed his presence at a deeper level. I drew near and and he drew near to me. And I, I can't adequately describe to you what that is like, but... But if you've done it, you'll know that when we open our hearts to him, when we make room for him, he comes and we encounter a a, a depth of his presence with us. And it's it's as if he's waiting. He 
He's just waiting. He's not elsewhere. He's there. And if we make room for him, he'll come and he'll visit us. And we'll experience him. We'll encounter him at a deeper level. And that's my invitation to you. That he might become greater in you. As you make room. As you allow yourself to become less. As you pursue him. Why don't the musicians come and join Tamsi? Church, let's pray. Kind of invite you where you are. If you know the Lord, if you're seeking to step on this journey in some way over the next three weeks, maybe you've not figured out what you're gonna do. Maybe that's something to, to think about later today, but is there a heart response today? Say, God, I need you. I desire you. I must have you. I thank you for what I've glimpsed. Let me see more. I thank you for what I've experienced. Would you let me experience more? Would you come? Help me to make room. Lord, we come to seek you. We commit these three weeks to you. God, that we might find you. We thank you, Jesus, for your promise that if we ask, we receive. If we seek, we'll find. If we knock, the door will be opened. God, help us to draw near. Lord, we know we won't impress you by our fasting. But we pray, God, as we, as we discipline the flesh, May we decrease, that you in us may increase. Your light, your life, your godliness, your presence, your peace, your joy, your amazing grace. We thank you, you are the God who answers prayer. We pray, God, as we make room, would you come and dwell with us? Would you tabernacle with us? Would you come and fill us afresh? As John the Baptist said that he would baptize with the Spirit and fire. We pray as we seek you, would you come and fill us afresh? Holy Spirit, fill our homes, fill our rooms, fill our lives, the places where we work and study. Help us to shake off the dust and to enter in.